This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Got another great guest for you today. He's a big operator. They've got parks all over the country, and they have a really interesting story how they got started. His, his partner, Daniel Weisfeld, has been on before, but today we get the other half, the co-founder here, Yoel Kelman of Three Pillar Communities. Yoel, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I've been, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you finally accepted my invitation. I've been wanting to have you on. Um, so tell us a little, I know a lot about you, but for our audience that may not, uh, tell us more of your background, how you guys got started, and we'll talk more about your guys' operation, which has been you know, been fun to watch. You guys have got an impressive team going on. Thank you, Ferd. So we are five and a half years in. Uh, we currently manage uh, 53 communities in 11 states. Um, we started out, like I said, five and a half years ago, um, the long and short of it is, you know, Daniel, my business partner calls me and says, Hey, we're both in career transitions. Um, says like, you know, let's start buying mobile home parks together. And we were both trying to figure out what to do next. That was kind of an idea. We put that on the shelf. Um, ended up that I was, I was looking for a, a car for my wife and, uh, my, my friend, my brother's friend had bought his car on a police foreclosure, uh, website. So I was searching police foreclosures, just looking at like, car auction, you know, here's a Ford Taurus, here's a Toyota Camry, here's a mobile home park in upstate New York. Wow. And it was like $6,000. It didn't make sense. And it was one of these like auctions where it's got a week left and every time you bid, it adds another minute to the auction. Mm-hmm. So I sent it to Daniel. I sent it to Daniel's aunt, who was kind of like our advisor and, you know, started digging in, called the county, tried to understand what happened. It was like a slum landlord who didn't pay his seller carry, didn't pay his water bill, didn't pay his property tax. When everybody came to get their piece, you know, the property taxes are going to trump all. And the county foreclosed on this property. It was like fifty thousand dollars in back taxes, and um, it was. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember the day, but let's just call it a Tuesday. And the auction ended Thursday. And I was out in Boston. The property was six hours away, so I finished my kind of consulting day job and told them I was going to take the next day off. And drove out at like seven p.m. Got to upstate New York at one a.m. Met the park manager the next morning. Um, like hours before the auction ended and um, sitting there first, like kind of putting in our bid, watching it, you know, go. And then every minute as it keeps overbidding. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to put in my max bid and walk away. And uh, I put in my max bid and drive away from the park. Uh, I was going to meet another park owner where I had connected with while doing some diligence. I opened up my laptop and I'm like, oh, we just bought a mobile home park. I called Daniel. And I was like, we just started a business together. And wow. um, that was our first park, uh, our only park in New York. I that's like your a, normal, that's your normal DD process, right? That's it. Yeah. I was like a 17 space park, with 17 park on homes. Like right there, if you were to pitch that to me, I'd be like, no, right now, you know, off the bat. But it was our first deal. We bought it for thousands, single digit low thousands per pad. Um, it needed a ton of work. And we really, you know, got our first value add experience doing stuff on that park at a tiny scale. Like fix the potholes, fix the park on homes you know, fix the plumbing, like really everything that can happen at a park more or less um, has happened there. And, you know, it was, it was a great start. It was kind of a small deal, which I think was a really good place to start. Um, went on there and really after that focused more on the West Coast, which is kind of where um, Daniel was based and we picking markets liked a lot more. And, um, you know, from there we did a 50 space park outside of Seattle. We actually did a 10 space park outside of Portland um, and started growing from there. And, uh, yeah, here we are. And I'll, I'm rambling here, but I'll give you the quick high level of my background before mobile home parks. Um, I, uh, studied accounting undergrad, did, uh, five years of financial consulting, mostly private equity, M and a consulting, doing kind of financial reviews. Um, got my CPA, but never practiced accounting, uh, went to business school with the idea of wanting to get an alternative energy. And I started a, a oh, smart cool. home clean tech startup there called EcoVent. It was like a connected home system of vents and sensors. Ran that company for four years, sold it to some investors. And that was when I was in my career transition. And Daniel called me and said, let's, let's get into this. Wow. That's interesting. So the park in New York, do you guys still own it? 
We do. We're looking to sell it. It's one of these that like every time we think we're making progress, we've made a lot of progress. We have like mostly tenant on homes now, you know, for the first three years, I think we tracked, you know, the, the marginal rent you get from the home versus a lot rent. And then you look at your park on home expenses and it was like one to one. Yeah. Cause it was like $300 per home rent. And then a furnace goes bad and then a roof goes bad. And like, and at the end of the day, we felt like fine about it. Cause like, man, that, that park has just like every stereotype you hear about like the landlord, the trailer park landlord, it was this guy. Like they had warrants out for his arrest because he wouldn't pay water bills. And like they would shut off the water and tenants would call and complain. Like we're paying our rent and you right. can't shut right. people's water off. So they would turn on this guy that like, couldn't st- set foot in the town. It was really wild. And so like to turn that around a place where, like people can own their own homes and have like really, really affordable, reasonable rent. Um, it's really great. But it's always one of these where like, it's like two steps forward, one step back. And so it's, you know, we've done a lot and we're ready to kind of move on. So we're planning on selling that pretty soon. Got it. No, I think you described a lot of the pros and cons. There are mostly the cons of a small park with park owned homes. It's like the park owned home model, I think can work, but the challenge on a small park is you don't have enough scale to have a, a full-time maintenance person. So you're hiring pros instead of an on, on staff maintenance person at a much lower hourly rate. And then you get that upside of the top line park on home revenue, but it goes out the bottom as far as expenses. So you feel like you really, and to do it, to do it remotely in an area where you don't have, have scale, it's, it's pretty challenging. Yep. Absolutely. But a lot and of lessons learned on that part. Yeah. yeah. When I look at deals, but broker send me a deal. Like, hey, it's got a lot, a lot of park on homes. I'll be like, well, let me see where it's at relative to my other parks. So, I yeah. mean, I have some parks where we don't do any rentals because like we have a small park in Des Moines. It came with five homes for sale only. Like, why won't you rent them? Because I only have five. I can't hire a regular maintenance person with only five in Kansas city. We have dozens and dozens of rentals. Like I don't want more rental. Okay. That's 50 instead of, you know, 49, not a big deal. I've already got maintenance people in two different locations. Okay. The toilet leaks, go fix it. You know, the roof yeah. leaks, go fix it versus, Oh, the roof leaks who am I going to call? I have no other vendor in that market. You know, nobody wants to come over for a $150 job. And they're like, yeah. Oh, re- replace the roof. Like, I don't want to replace the roof. I want you to just <laughs> patch it, you know? Yep. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think also the age of the home is a big factor. You know, this, this park, I think the, the newest home was like a 74 and they went back to like the fifties. Like one of them was like literally like a, a skirted travel trailer. And yeah. at a certain point, no matter how rehab the home is, it becomes a liability rather than an asset. And, um, you know, that's something when we see park owned homes, we are generally of the mindset of sell them off, but primary is like, are they worth $10,000 or do they cost you $5,000? No, good point. I mean, I have some, I have some older ones that work out. Okay. But it really comes down to size. You know, like if it's a, if it's an 80 and it's 14 feet wide, I can live with that. You can put some money into it, but if it's a 76 and it's 10 or 12 feet wide, it's like, okay, now it's just harder to sell, harder to get a quality tenant. So it's, it's like, Oh my gosh, just give it away, you know, rather yeah. than, rather than manage it for 10 years. But yeah. So what is your, I'm curious, what is your minimum lot size you guys will look at now, now that you have, you know, big portfolio, you know, are you going to look at a 25 spacer nowadays or no? For it, it's a constant, constant question. Um, we, we probably talk about it once a month because you know deals will come by our desk. Um, I'm always the one of like, we shouldn't do the small deals because you do a value add small deal and just like the numbers it takes to move the needle, like the, the change it takes, it's, it's a lot of work. Right. Um, and at the same time, you're like, man, that's a really good price per pad and a really good market. The real determinant for us has been if we've got stuff in the market, we're a lot more willing to take on a smaller deal. Um, we bought like a $2 million deal last year in, in Salem, Oregon, where we've got four other parks, three of them are small. And then we've got kind of two managers who are overseeing those four or five assets and another one outside of town. And that works. But two years ago, we bought a 39, 40 space park on very, what I call South Canada. It's like all the way on the Washington border. Um, and, you know, we don't have anybody to manage it. We have to pay like an overstaffed part-time person because this is one tiny asset. And um, we, I think we got a good basis, but man, it's like, it's hard when you got those little assets and they're kind of orphaned. So it's really dependent on where it is relative to our other assets. But generally... I like to see $4 million or more on a purchase price. Um, and then especially when we're moving into new markets, we want at least four, usually six, seven, eight to make it make sense to go into a new market. Now for, our, I'm familiar with your guys' footprint, but for some of our audience that maybe is not four million in, you know, the South or in, you know, Southern Illinois, that's a big price, right? But if you guys are out on West coast, 
you yeah. know, I think 4 million in Southern Illinois, what is this thing like 200 pads, but you guys may be at what, you know, 50 pads or even less on some of yeah. you know, some of those markets where you got six, seven, $800 lot rent. That's right. Yeah. So a lot of our properties are Washington, Oregon, uh, California. Um, and then we've got I think, five parks in Colorado, a couple in Texas, um, one in Arizona, two in Idaho, a couple in Florida. Um, so we try and go to markets where you're going to have higher price per pad, higher lot rents, higher home values. Uh, we've stayed away right now from like kind of Midwest markets, but we're starting to look more everywhere. We started out very concentrated in the West and now we've branched out. Um, but you're right. I think really with $4 million and in some cases, you know, if you're doing 200 pads in Illinois, like from a management fee perspective, you're going to do a lot better because you're going to have a higher cap rate. You're going to have higher rent multiplier. So um, that's always the big thing for me is like, if you have a single park in a single market and you have a regional manager covering that asset from an operations perspective, you're probably losing money, right? Like the management fee is not going to cover all the cost of learning and, you know, getting all the, the state laws in hand and all that stuff. Um, so we really want to make sure it's worth the investment and we try and pick markets we want to expand into as we grow. I think, I think overall that's wise. I mean, we had a deal and we have parks in Missouri, but I had a park in Springfield, Missouri market where I didn't know anything. And it was a small park. I think it was like 36 pads. And it, if it would have been an easy one, I'm mean like, okay, it's minimal cost, little park greeter. But this one I think needed more full-time management, but it wasn't big enough to absorb full-time management. So right. we ended up, but not mine. It went up wholesaling it to one of my other clients that had, had four or five, six parks in that market. And the first thing he asked me was, why aren't you buying it? I said, cause I don't have a manager local. You, it's yeah. worth more to you than me. It just is because you can just, it's just, a, it's just a bolt on. You can just, yeah. oh, hey, hey, Jim, I know you got 60 pads. How about another 35? Okay, we can make that yeah. work versus me. How do I, I got, you know, to find a manager for 35 pads in a 300 lot rent market, I can't, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've had a similar thing where, you know, we'll go to people who we have either done deals together with or just admire how they're working and say, Hey, we're not in this market. It still doesn't make sense for us. You know, take a look. Does it fit your, fit your bill? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, I'm curious, you could share with us how you guys have been able to scale in numerous States and, and what were some of the keys to success? I feel like for a lot of, you know, small operators, it's, it's quote easy. Cause you can just do it yourself. Like, you know, me and my dad can manage two, three parks, no big deal. But then once you get to six and eight and 10, it's like, okay, well now we need, we clearly need more staff, but there's a, there's a, a chasm there. You have to kind of cross before you can afford, you know, $150,000 staff person and people with that kind of talent. So yeah. how, how'd you guys navigate that from a growth perspective? Yeah, it's been tough. It's kind of one of the, the constant kind of push and pulls of, uh, you know, wanting to hire, but also wanting to balance a budget um, or needing to balance a budget, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it started off a lot of investing and really understanding the tools we had and building processes that could scale. So when we started, it was like me and Daniel and Daniel's family owned some, owned some parks and we were fee managing them. And they had like an accounting person who worked for them who really kind of ran their parks. And the first thing we do is I learned rent manager on a 12 space park. And I learned it like very, very thoroughly. Figured all the ways we could roll it out. We rolled it out to Daniel's family's parks. And every park we started buying, it's like kind of instead of recreating the wheel, everything was really like automated, right? So it went from like using Google Sheets to collect rents to everything's in, in rent manager. We don't yeah. take checks. You pay either online or you, we auto debit or you pay with cash at a store. Like all, all revenue is now accounted for automatically. When you have to issue late notices, all the templates are in the right places. When you have to run background checks, people are applying online. And the more processes you can build and train your, your people on, um, we found that kind of being a pretty big key. Um, and then it kind of deciding when you got to take the leap and say, Hey, like, you know, we hired a regional manager for the Southeast. We currently have two communities there, right? We believe it's going to be a growth area. We have offers outstanding on several right now. And I think it will be a growth area, but right now we're paying somebody and we've got kind of a, a strong bench there, which is, it's an investment in our part. And so you have to be able to like, kind of from a capitalization perspective, be able to afford that, um, or kind of find ways to, to foot that bill. Uh, and then also just kind of invest in your growth to make sure that when you have the opportunities, you can make the best of them. That's a good point you bring up. That's something that I had struggled with and just was hire before you need somebody, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the first hire is kind of the hardest, but then yeah. each one is still hard. Like, do I want to hire one more person? Well, I don't know if I have the work yet. Well, you're betting on the come, like the work will come. And you know what? It seems like no matter how many people I hire, we need more. one more, you know, yeah. you, you always, the work seems to, you know, I don't think I hate the manufacturer work, but the work always seems to find the space. 
So it's kind of that we have the same analysis regularly is like, you know, are we almost ready for another person? If so, let's hire. And then, yeah. you know, sure enough, you'll feel the work. And then if you've got the bench, you're probably going to be able to look at more deals and be more aggressive from an acquisition standpoint. Cause you know, you got the bandwidth on the bench to help. Yeah. Is that kind of your philosophy? Was, yeah. I think that was kind of a switch, you know, before this, I had a tech startup and the classic, one of the, one of the classic tech startup mistakes that we also fell into was we hired fast and fired slowly instead of slowly hire and fire fast. And so didn't want to make that mistake again. So we were very conservative in our hiring as we started to grow. We found, you know, I, I like to say, we don't want to build a company built on heroics, but like two or three years ago, that's what we were doing. People were working really long hours and really hard, really getting into the details and, you know, doing a lot of work to make sure we're stretching everybody. And you know, when we hired that next person, it was really like a release valve. And we've gotten to a point where we don't have to be that rigorous, but we still are very trying to be very conservative when we hire. I'd also say we've, um, we brought on a CFO, I think a little over a year now, and he has helped us kind of find a lot of work um, offshore. So we have a lot of people in the Philippines are helping us. And the cost of work in the Philippines is much lower than in the US and we're a fully remote team. So it was kind of a natural extension to say, well, if people can do the work anywhere in the US, why can't they do it anywhere in the world? And if those, if the people were getting to help us do mostly admin finance work, but uh, some operation stuff as well, if they cost five to $10 an hour, it's a lot easier to make a hiring decision than hiring somebody who's gonna cost two to three times that. Sure. So that's yeah, interesting. So. I know, I know you guys have gone with that route. I know several others have. So how does that work practically from, you know, do they, they work your hours, you know, in, in the West coast and, and, or do they all speak English or is there one person that speaks English that is the kind of the, the leader and you work with that person or how, how does that work out practically? Yeah. So um, they all speak English, like I would say very, very well. Um, that's part of the interview process. They'll send like uh, audio clips of, of, um, you know, of their English. Um, most of them are working our hours or some hybrid of our hours and their hours. So we'll be on calls with people who are working at three, four in the morning of their time. Um, they kind of do that signing up. We've had a couple people say it's not working for them, but for the most part, people are able to hack it if that's what they're signing up for. Um, and then they don't have to be kind of concurrent all the time. If you're doing bookkeeping and you know, you don't have to be online all the time, but you have to be at team meetings and things like that. Um, and it's worked really well. We've been able to find people who have rent manager experience. We've been able to find people who have property accounting experience. Uh, we had, we've had some help on the acquisition side, doing kind of due diligence calls, um, some help on the marketing side, posting ads and, and, and you know, vetting um, leads and things like that. So it's, it's been good. It's been really helpful. Interesting. That's great. Yeah. What other, what other tips or tricks do you have that you can share as far as um, whether it's, you know, scaling for growth or sourcing deals. I mean, I know, you know, what per- I'm curious, what percent of your deals are you guys finding off market versus on market versus uh, pocket listings? I think most of our deals, and it'd be interesting to go through and do like tally, but most of our deals are probably pocket listings where broker says a broker or a bird dog, someone who's kind of an unofficial broker um, says, Hey, I've got a seller. This is their price. This is what they're interested in. Um, you know, look well, great. Let's get on a call with them, get us a PL rent roll, play that offers that way. We have bought a handful of listed deals. I'd say for every listed deal we've bought, we've probably lost on four or five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know very competitive market out there. And I think the bigger stuff that gets listed, we're just not capital competitive right now. We'd love to be there at some point. But uh, right now, our the ex- return expectations of our capital partners and investors don't line up with what we think we can deliver. Um, I will say we tend to be very conservative in our underwriting. This is another, t- another tech startup learning lesson. Or like when you're in a tech startup, you, you know, you're kind of trying to, I say it's like trying to hit a grand slam on rollerblades. It's like super, super hard. We were doing the hardware, which is like an, an added layer of complexity. Um, whereas real estate, like if you have reasonable expectations and you have, you know, you're conservatively underwriting, like you can make the ends meet. And we've been able to do that. And thankfully, because we've been conservative, we've been able to exceed expectations often, which is really what you want to do as a, somebody who's investing for, for your investors. Um, and I think that coupled with the operating principles that we choose to run our business, which is like, we don't want to be making the headlines for cranking people's rents. And I want to go to bed feeling like I'm doing well for my residents and for my investors. When you put conservative underwriting together with moderate rent increases, you end up with losing a lot of deals. And I think I'm okay yeah. with that on the listed stuff because 
you know, I, I don't want to be doing one of the other, one of the other two. I don't want to be worried. I'm not going to deliver to my investors. And I don't want to be worried that I'm going to like displace people with like egregious rent increases. No, that's, that's a good point. I looked at a deal yesterday and part of the reason I haven't even told the broker yet, but part of the reason I'm not going to buy it is the last guy just bought it, double the rent and is trying to hurry up and flip it. I'm like, one, that's not seasoned income. Two, people have pitchforks at him. So I don't really want to be his successor, but three, yeah. it just feels like this is, this wasn't the proper way to do it. I don't really feel like being the guy that lines this, this bad guy's pocket. And this guy's been a bad that. guy. He's got, a, he's got some criminal charges on a number of things as well. So I'm like, I don't really feel like just getting in bed with this guy, even though we're going to be opposing, opposing sides. So it's just, right. Yep. You don't want to inherit that. I mean, we've bought deals where somebody buys right and moves rents kind of closer to market and sells in two years. I'm fine with that, but I hear there's, there's a line. I agree with you. You don't want to step into somebody's like what they've created is a dumpster fire and you're coming to pay market price for their good buy plus their egregious rents. Yeah. Right. I mean, we we're, we were getting ready uh, to sell. I can't disclose all the details on this one yet, but we're you know selling this park to this group. And in my opinion, they're paying too much. So just like, how are they going to make this work? I'm sitting here like, I feel a little bad. I'm just a seller. Right. But I'm like, they're paying too much. How are, how are they going to make it work? They're going to raise rents and they're not going to raise rents $20. So I'm just like, okay, you know, felt a little bad, but I'm, I don't think they raise it that much, but like, I know I had a friend who sold to one group that's notorious for doubling rents and he felt really bad. And this was a big park, like 400 some spaces in Michigan. Wow. And, yeah. and they gave him a crazy price and he, his, he was able to, in the sales contract, get them agree to not increase rent more than 10% for two consecutive years. So that, and make a lease amendment pre-closing so that any of the existing residents that this guy had taken care of, you know, if they, they at least knew, Hey, look, you got two years before the, the real pain is going to come. And I asked him how it worked out. And he said, you know, most people, they refused to sign the two year increase. They're like, what do you mean rent 10% and 10%? That's more than you guys have ever done. He's oh, like, boy. I know, but the next guy's going to do him a hundred. And he said, most of the residents wouldn't sign the amendment. They thought it was like a bluff, but this guy to like, you know, try to get more rent. He's like, no, no, I'm not extorting rent out of you. I'm literally protecting you. Hmm. And the, the group that did it ended up making the news, you know, so I don't know if it, if the rent raise actually stuck, but he's like, here was a seller that was, you know, like he was like, I'm going to get paid a lot, but I'm going to, you know, not be super greedy and I'm going to, you know, protect my residents. I'd, I'd never seen anybody do that. So I thought that was kind of interesting, yeah. but also I'm, I'm kind of cool, but also kind of surprised he was able to pull it off that the yeah. buyer agreed. And I guess the buyer's like, look, we'll do it 10%, 10% and we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll whack them in year three is like, okay, I guess that's, I guess that's yeah. a model, but not one that I really want to be a part of. So. Yeah. I had, we had, we had one where we bought a park where like, you know, dad built it and junior lived in it with his mom and his sister and like different homes. And it was largely, it was 78 spaces of 25 occupied lots. Mm. And, um, you know, they'd been living there. They just decided they didn't want more neighbors. And they decided that because they brought homes in in 2007, they couldn't sell more homes. And so they sold it with a seller carry and they were charging rents of like 250 in a market that should have been 500. And they gave us a rule. You can't increase more rents more than like, 12% a year. And so these guys were getting really, really small increases. And it was, it was, we couldn't increase rents as long as we had a seller carry with them. Okay. So for three years, we filled up the park. We, you know, we got it just about full now. We refinanced and we gave everyone, you know, uh, an increase to below market, but a, a material increase. And like no one complained because everyone knew they had it so good that, right. um, you know, but that, I think that's different than we're doubling the rent and, uh, you know, nothing you can do about it. That That's a pretty wild story. We also, we sold them where I thought the guys were paying a lot for the park. And after the transaction, I was talking to you know a buddy of mine who works with them. I said, you know, how'd you guys underwrite this? And it was interesting. It was like their rent increases weren't egregious as much as they had a, a higher perception of the value of rents in the market. I think they looked at it and they thought like market rents were below what they should be for the market relative to housing costs. And like eventually rents would get to a place that I didn't believe they would get to, which was kind of, refreshing to know that they weren't going to just bring pain and just yeah. had a different macro outlook on the deal. Interesting. Yeah. I think, you know, I think in general, right. You want to just give people value. And we had one park where we took it rents for 122. The market was 200. We raised them to 180 with a 90 day wow. notice this is in Illinois. And I felt bad, I'm like it's 50% rent. But I looked at the rent rolls and the leases and the leases had been in place for nine years that I could see 
and, and no rent increase for nine consecutive years. And the park was garbage. So we immediately spent a ton of money. We, we trim, we spent like $65,000 the first two days on trimming trees, fixing roads, you know, painting houses, demoing houses. And the trees were like the hidden garden overtaking the street. And my dad was on site and he said when the, that he was with this lady at, at four o'clock, she called her husband and said, I just got home from work. When you come home, you're not going to believe it. The park is gone. Like it, it looked different because it, she's like, it's not even the same park because it had changed so much in the first day. And we, you know what? We had zero complaints yep. taking the rent from 122 to 180. And some of those people had not, one lady had not paid in 62 months. And wow. we're like, what? She's, she's never paid, never paid, never paid. The manager owned two or three houses, never paid any of them, rent them out you know, it's never, it's never paid. It's like, okay, well, you, we'll keep you on as a greeter slash manager, but you only get free rent on the one you live in. And that lasted like two weeks. And he's like, this stinks. I'm not paying rent. You know, I'm moving out, um, which ended up you know being a good decision in the number. Of sure. ways. But yeah. Um, yeah. So they, they were, you know, that was the biggest percentage increase, you know, that, that I'd ever done. Most of my, much less than that, but it was a, it was a big deal, you know, but nobody, but the rents were so low. Like the percentage increase is ridiculous there though. It's like, it's such an irrelevant number, right? When someone's paying $122, like, come on. Right. And all the homes were paid off, right. This is like seventies and eighties. I'm like, where else in America are you going to live for $122? And we have a, we have a playground. We didn't have a dog park. We had a playground. It was a tree neighborhood. It, one side was a tree line. One side was like a concrete plant. So it didn't look that good, but it was like a private little subdivision in town in the County seat of a town of like 30,000 people. I'm like, you guys need to be paying at least 200, but we'll get you there. So the next year we went to, I think we went to 195 the next year and 210. And, you know, it still is a yeah. modest lot. It still is a pretty modest lot rent market, but 122 was really low. It's hard for me maybe because I'm kind of like West coast biased, but like I get shocked when I hear below $300 really anywhere. Um, yeah. It's just like, there's a, there's a cost of living. There's property tax, there's management costs. There's you know, management. It's like, Stuff adds up, man. I, I just can't imagine how a park runs at one hundred twenty-two dollars, uh, you know, a spot. I mean, definitely a lot of deferred maintenance. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, we, oh, we flipped that park. So we, anything. Yeah, I only wow. held it. I only held it for two years. Um, uh -huh. Flipped that park. Yeah, that's that's that is a good point though. You know, and, and Frank Rolf has a good uh, analysis on this where he says, you know, if you don't increase the rents over time you're asking for the park to be redeveloped into a multifamily or home Depot or something else, because the yeah. rents are just so stinking low. And so either a, they get redeveloped or B it just sticks around until the infrastructure fails. There's a park yeah. here in Belton, Missouri, just South Kansas city. I own a park there. And there's another one down the street that I've been trying to buy for years and can never come to terms with the seller. And he just, it just kept going to waste, going to waste, going to waste. I looked at the P and L it was, it was bleeding net cash flow minus minus one fifty a year. Um, NOI. So I'm like, what is it? I'm like, you guys, you have major, major water leaks. You got your managers, you know, probably embezzling, but at least overpaid. And, you know, if it's infrastructure failed and, and, you know, eventually the city bought it for 30% of what I was offering two years ago. Yeah. And I'm actually bought three homes from the guys on the way out the door because the city got rid of all the homes. And there was three that were nineties that I said, I'll take them on. I got three nineties models homes for 5,000 a piece and wow. everything else got scraped. Wow. That's it's crazy. Like, it's going to be redeveloped because the, because the, it was mismanaged. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the first deals we bought was also, it was in the one outside of Seattle. Uh, it was really interesting. This, this kind of eccentric dude bought it and um, it's across the street from where Jimi Hendrix is buried. And he was going to make it into a Jimi Hendrix museum. You can look up articles about how they were going to shut down a 49 space community. And he towed over the house that Jimi Hendrix grew up in. And um, it was like sitting in the front of this park. And the city was like, we're not going to let you displace 50 families so you can make a museum for Jimi Hendrix. So he's like, all right, fine, I'm going to sell it. And he was going to sell it for mixed use. It was going to be re re retail and then residential. And the guys who were trying to buy it were, they couldn't close. They couldn't get the funds together. So we kind of swooped in and said, hey, you're out of contract. Sell it to us. And... I mean, he was just so under managing it. Rents were low and like it was complete neglect and people would wake up in the morning. And they couldn't like drive out their driveway because everyone was like parking in the fire lane. The first day we showed up and we said any cars in the fire lane were towing every abandoned car were towing. We got like 20 cars out of there. And then we started charging people for parking. We built a parking lot and people were like charge more for parking. Cause I want to like, I want the cars out. And then everybody could wake up in the morning and leave their home and go to work. And that was like a huge upgrade just to like show up and care. 
And wow. um, yeah, I mean, no one complained. We started charging for parking. They said charge more. Wow. That's a new one. I've, I've not charged for parking and I've charged, I guess, for extra spaces, but that's, that's oh, yeah, great. That's extra spaces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's, that's great. That's one yeah. thing that I feel like people would forget during their due diligence is parking ratios. Cause I've had it happen and not necessarily that I forgot on, I've done it on two parks, not that I necessarily forgot as much as I just said, well, I'll make it work. And I had to, I didn't pave on my poured gravel, but one park was so dense. It was 15 feet between all the homes, 54 spaces. And we, it was no, it was only one park spot right in front of the home. We just poured gravel between it, all the yards. There was no grass. My mowing bill at the park is literally zero. Um, yeah. And we just said one car in front of the house, one car in the gravel side yard, but that, because it was historically always below 50% occupancy. So in order to get the, uh, I wanted to get the occupancy up, but yeah. then immediately I needed twice as many parking spaces. So I had to create them. It didn't uh, cost much to do the gravel, right. but people were parking in the grass anyway, and it was mud. So yeah. you had to get creative there and the city didn't seem to mind. <laughs> and I never, I guess I never asked. But. Huh. That's one of those things that like, you know, if you're getting an agency loan, they look at that stuff. But if you're getting a bank loan, they typically don't. There's a lot of stuff that like, if you're getting a bank loan, you can get away with things that you should know whether or not you should get away with them. You know, I think a phase one is a good example. A bank doesn't do a phase one. Right. But if you don't do a phase one, one day you might find out, oh, there's a gas station here, or there's you know, a dry cleaner, or whatever it is. Um, the parking ratio thing is something I don't think we're ever asked from a, from a bank, but you're, you're constantly asked from agency. And um, I don't think we've run into it, but it's, it's an interesting thing. Like, as you're saying, I'm thinking, like, oh, I don't think we've, I don't think we look at that as close as we should. No, people don't look at it, but here's, here's the interesting thing is I refinanced that deal with Fannie Mae last year and they said, Oh, two parking spaces yeah, per right, house. Right. And yeah. it worked. There you and go. Yeah. you know, the, my lender told me, you know, they do the property condition assessment and, you know, I've done them on several deals and they give you, you know, this big naughty list of everything you got to fix. You got to put it in escrow. So a tip I would give people here is if, if you know, the bank's going to make you fix it, just fix it in advance. Because then when the appraiser shows up, like I repaved the streets before the appraiser shows up, but then he doesn't spill his coffee in his lap, hitting potholes. Well, then it's like, Oh, it's newly fresh roads and it looks good. And I, I schedule the, the sealant, like, like literally like one to three days before the guy shows up. So it's just like yeah. jet black, like McDonald's parking lot. But on this park, I did that. I repaved the streets. Um, we had, we took We had one big demo area. We put a playground in the middle so that it was just one playground with mulch. We had zero grass. We painted every single home. And then the PCA came in and the guy at my banker's like, well, it's, the loan's not final. We're waiting on the PCA, waiting on the PCA. And I was like, there's nothing wrong with this thing. It's a no frills park. There's nothing wrong. And he came back and he said, I've been doing this for 10 years. This is the first time the PCA is a zero dollar repairs. Wow. It was zero. You know, they I normally have like six, that. That's wild. six months and then 12 months. He's like zero escrow. I was like, yep. That's crazy. I got, I got 54 gravel. The, uh, they didn't make you pay for the off street parking. No, no gravel. It must be a Freddie thing. I think Freddie makes you, I'm not sure if Fanny does. No, well, they didn't. I have, yeah. It's awesome. Actually I have, um, yeah, I have two Fannie loans with the same gravel, but the other one has, you know, has regular parking and street parking. And right. I, I just put in the gravel because I had a, I put a lot of double wise in there. So I got a, a lot of kind of two generation families that have three and yeah. four cars. But this other park in Illinois, just no, I just gravel because I looked at getting asphalt, but it was going to be hard to do with um, the home so close together. It had to, you know. Yeah put in forms because it's going to then with the homes sticking together and the, and the skirting sticking into the asphalt. So like, let's just put gravel down. Obviously yeah. it was much cheaper also, um, but it worked, but everybody was pleased, you know, cause they had yeah. mud. Right. So I didn't even charge them. You know, we just put them, put it, put them down, but um, yeah. you know, new value, right. Find value where you can. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great upgrade. That's, a, that's also a record. I've never heard of a zero PCA. I feel like they always got to find something. It's like their job, right? They got to right. come and tell you something's wrong or they're not doing their job. But there was I just nothing there that anymore for you've taken that from me. Now I can't tell my that. I just try to find something because apparently there is the perfect park. Yeah, <laughs> apparently perfect park, I guess. Yeah. But, um, it was, yeah. And also on the same park, most of the homes were from 1970 to 79. So I'd also heard, no, you got to have newer homes. Like, no, these were old. And the homes were two inches from the setback line on the yeah. perimeter. Um, they were at least 10 feet apart for fire code, but I didn't put them that close. I wouldn't have, but that's how, that's how it was. Um, and I had a 1976 boundary survey. They didn't make me do an Alta survey or a table A. Yeah. It was like, it was like the ultimate low cost refinance. That's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, what, Lova, Yoel, what else, what else do you want to share? Any, any other you know, tips or stories you want to share before we part? Uh, no, I mean, if anybody, you know, I'm happy to always connect with other park operators. If people want to chat about deals and look at opportunities together. Um, you know, one thing I really love about this industry is I think there's, there's a ton of collaboration. There are so many people who you call competitors of mine that like we swap ideas on what we're doing. Like I'll call up people who are like, we'll go head to head on deals. And I'll say, Hey, I'm looking at this deal. You're looking at it now. Can you talk through it with me and give me your thoughts? And you know, on operations, there's a bunch of folks I say like, Hey, what tools are you using? And really the only thing we all compete on is deals. Um, so sometimes that's sensitive, but even there, like there's another guy who operates in California and we'll call each other and talk through stuff. Um, so if anybody out there ever wants to you know, chat on a deal, I'm happy to, happy to connect. It's Yoel at three pillar communities.com. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. Hey, one more, one more question before I forget, because I just thought of it while you were talking, because you're talking about, you know, partnering with people or joint venture or just, or just sharing ideas. How do you, how do you guys raise money? I'm curious, because you guys have raised a lot of money. What, how do you know, that's a form of partnership in, you know, is it, you know, do you guys prefer the syndication model or is it more JV, you know, a bunch of smaller medium investors or a, a small number of, you know, very large investors? Yeah. So to date, I think we've raised somewhere between like 90 to hundred million dollars of equity. And it's mostly been from friends, family, high net worth investors. Um, you know, our biggest investor is a guy we bought a park from, and then he's sub- subsequently probably invested like 10 to $12 million with us in other deals. But for the most part, it's people who are putting 50 to hundred thousand dollar checks. Um, they tell their friends, Hey, these guys are doing good work. And we've kind of grown our base that way. And we really like that. We like kind of democratizing um, access to private equity, real estate, we'll call it, you know, it's not, usually our minimum is 25 to 50 K in a deal. We're not doing hundred, hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars minimums. We really want to build a, a broad book of business with investors and really like people don't have to be millionaires to invest in real estate. Um, and that's worked out really well for us. We've really enjoyed that. And we've had talks with bigger capital partners. I think a lot of times the earnings expectations or the income expectations are not in line with what we're seeing in the marketplace. And that might go back to what I was saying earlier about conservative underwriting and wanting to run our business a certain way. Um, we still have those conversations, but to date, everything's been friends, family, high net worth. And we love that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I know that that's intimidating for a lot of our audience. How do you raise money? You know, where, and like, I know you've, I'm sure you've talked to some of the big players and family offices and, and I've done it to some degree. And I feel like my concern with that is, then I got a boss and I lose control versus investors. It's like, Hey, I'm a partner, but I'm the partner that you want doing the work. So like I'm the lead partner and thank you for your support and and your trust, but you're just going to, you know, not blindly, but invest with me and then, and then trust that I'm going to do it right. Versus I've had, I had one group that they started my, my kind of pitch and they just said, I'm offended by your splits and you're offering, um, if you're not willing to change your terms to what we want, we'll just end this conversation now. It's just like, right. whoa. Like, I mean, like in the first minute, like, yeah. I mean, I saw, and it was talking about writing a huge check. So I said something like, obviously, if you guys write a huge check, I'm going to be open to negotiation and I'm going to listen and collaborate, but it's going to be a, a true two way street, not just, you know. And I had one yeah. group, was a, and the guy was a billionaire which I didn't realize. So I didn't do my DD. Apparently I didn't realize till later. And he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a salary. We're going to build up a team. You're going to be, you're going to run a point. You're going to give, we're going to give you a profit. And so we're going to give you a bonus here, but it's, you know, you got to work in our office. I'm like, wait a second, man. I, I came here to ask for a check. You're I didn't come here to interview for a job as the director yeah. of trailer parks. And that's what I think you're trying to do here. So I was just like, <laughs> What's, you know, it yeah. was, it was clear that, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules and he was used to making the rules. I just yeah. didn't want to play, I just didn't want to play by him. So I like what you guys are doing that you're, you know, you're still maintaining your own uh, autonomy and control, but also just bringing more, I say, you know, small little guys and medium sized guys and gals into deals, giving people a taste that, you know, frankly is not available in a lot of, oper- a lot of other places. Absolutely. And, you know, I think another nice part is like we've partnered with investors that believe in our two part mission. Um, which is to deliver a safe, reliable housing to our residents and safe, reliable returns to our investors. And we really have to do both of those. And I think a good example is like, you know, in the beginning days of COVID when nobody knew what was going on, we're talking like March, 2020, 2020. And, um, you know, we're, we're figuring like we're going to default on our, on our mortgages. Like nobody's going to pay rent. Thankfully we actually did it really, really well during COVID and the, you know, the asset class weathered the storm better than most. Uh, but we emailed our investors and we said, hey, here's what we're seeing in the market. We're seeing a lot of concern about our residents becoming unemployed, not being able to make rent. 
We're going to give some people rent credits. We're going to give our, we had our, I think our whole portfolio, like $50 rent credits um, for a couple months. And investors were back and said, Hey, do what you got to do. If you need to do more, like by all means, we support you. No one was like, what are you doing? I need that money. And like, really, that's what we want. We want to work with people who are, who understand what we're doing is we're providing, you know, affordable housing and attainable housing to people and make sure we're not losing sight of our customers and our residents at the, at the expense of our, you know, at the prioritization of our return. So it's really been great to work with people um, that understand that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Glad to glad to hear it. Glad to see you guys succeed. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thank Thanks for again, you. Well, it was really fun. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, awesome. man. Yeah, you've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.